Glyphosate weed resistance is becoming a reality across the Midwest. Corn and soybean growers have been seeing weed control problems in their fields, and they seem to be getting worse. We talked with retailer Alan Vanderkrall in central Iowa. I've got two fields that I'm going to turn in. One's a water hemp problem, and the other one is a red giant rugby problem, and we've sprayed both fields twice. We still don't have them dead. I had a problem last year on it, but I thought it was just because stuff got away from us. But now all of a sudden it's the same field, same weed problem. So now I'm starting to wonder if it is in resistance. In northern Iowa, retailers Dave Huseman and Joe Tilgis told us that some of their growers didn't expect glyphosate resistance to be a problem for them. But they noted a case where 112 total ounces of glyphosate still did not control weeds. Iowa State University's Mike Owen shares another example. Thousand words right here. This is giant ragweed in an unnamed city, town, or village. Take your pick in north central Iowa. Giant ragweed 21 days after application. This is the cheap treatment. There's glyphosate at 48 ounces. Okay, obviously we didn't measure it right. We needed to put more on. Here's 96 ounces. This is a problem. This is a problem. Many growers in the Midwest are seeing the handwriting on the wall. In central Illinois, retailer Todd Wibben has seen water hemp survive 80 ounces of glyphosate, so he knows there is a problem. Todd Grisham, a retailer in Hardin, Kentucky, says Mare's Tail has become completely resistant to glyphosate. We talked with Chuck Forsman, manager of weed resistance strategies for Syngenta, and he provided some background on glyphosate weed resistance. Glyphosate resistance began to appear in the United States in 1998. Since then, the move of glyphosate weed resistance across the Midwest has been constant. There's about 11 million acres of glyphosate resistant infested row crops. What Syngenta is trying to do is get ahead of the uh, wave here, if you will, so that growers know exactly what they need to do to help stem this problem. In the state of North Carolina in 2010, there was a cotton grower who had to go out and hand weed at a cost of about $150 per acre. Not only do they pull the weeds out of the row, but that they haul these weeds to the turn row so, so that they're no longer in the field. And also in the state of Georgia uh, in 2009, 54% of all cotton acres had to be hand weeded. So that's a very significant expense, and it shows just how important it is for growers to stay on top of this weed problem. Resistance to other herbicides besides glyphosate adds to the challenge for growers. Here are a couple examples from weed scientist Pat Trannell at the University of Illinois. Fantastic new germplasm. Quad stack water hemp. These plants here that are surviving, they survived a pre-emergence application of Pursuit, which is an ALS inhibitor. We followed that up after the plants grew through that. About two inches tall, we treated them with atrazine, a photosystem 2 inhibitor. They survived that. And then when they are about four to six inches after they had time to recover from a little atrazine injury, we treated them with a tank mix of glyphosate and cobra, and they survived that as well. So four different herbicides, four completely different modes of action, and it can survive all of those. Another common problem is glyphosate-tolerant volunteer corn in soybean fields. If these or any weeds stay in the field, they steal nutrients, moisture, and light from the crop all season, cutting yield significantly. They can also cause problems at harvest, clogging combines, and spreading more resistant seed for future seasons. So growers are looking for answers, and there are solutions to fight glyphosate-resistant weeds. Here's Brian Young at Southern Illinois University. So what can we do to keep these resistant weeds at bay, keep them down south? Well, integrate better management tools. So don't rely on glyphosate as the only herbicide. Use different modes of action. can be a residual herbicide can be a post-emergence herbicide, but if I had to pick a winner, it would be the use of residual herbicide. That's just not just some guy from Southern Illinois saying that. That's Bob Hartzler at uh, Iowa State University and Mike Owen saying that. So it's University of Illinois. So all these weed specialists throughout the Midwest recommend a sore residual herbicide. Uh, why? Because it's going to reduce the amount of weeds you're actually trying to kill with glyphosate. Ohio retailer Joe Schroeder adds that using residuals with multiple modes of action provides clean fields, less worry about resistance, and more yield protection. Syngenta's Chuck Forsman agrees. We recommend to growers that they use pre-emergent residual herbicides on every acre. It's important that we deploy diversity out there 
on every acre. It's important that we reduce the selection pressure that's already out there, of course, on glyphosate, that we begin to take that burden of weed control off of glyphosate and use these pre-emergent residual herbicides. They're different modes of action, they work on germinating seedlings, and they're very effective. So it's a tool in the toolbox that we really need to get out there and deploy once again. This problem is growing, but Syngenta's resistance fighter herbicides are providing solutions for growers across the Midwest. In soybeans, prefix or boundary pre-emerge herbicides keep fields clean while protecting yield potential. Missouri grower David Locke shares his experience. What I've got is water hemp and giant ragweed are my main weeds, and it seems like the resistance is getting a problem with the, just a glyphosate alone. So now uh, I've used the, you know, the residual the prefix and sometimes apply a fall applied product too to help just keep the weeds down. Flexstar GT herbicide is an ideal post-emerge option, as Chris Schuler of Syngenta explains. Here in near Janesville, Minnesota, we're looking at a field, uh, soybean field sprayed with Flexstar GT. We've got water hemp here, we've got lamb's quarter throughout here. Uh, you can tell the activity from five days ago. This is lamb's quarter, what that looks like. Uh, you can pick up here what the, what the water hemp looks like. Um, off over here, you can see some part of the peat over here that hasn't been sprayed yet, where uh, we've got the water hemp growing like this. We've got lamb's quarter like this out here, and you can see right to the line where the product has been sprayed. So in comparison to glyphosate only, it's got two modes of action, um, which growers like because it, um, glyphosate up here is not um, killing like it used to, it's becoming more tolerant, especially lamps quarter, uh, water hemp, uh, velvet leaf, uh, and weeds like that. In corn, Lexar or Lumax Herbicide Pre or Halix GT Herbicide Early Post also provide options for control. In Wisconsin, retailer Brad Schuett says straight glyphosate just isn't working well, but using a residual like Halix GT controls his weeds and reduces the potential for ongoing resistance. Iowa grower Jim Lynch relies on the three modes of action in Lumax Herbicide for glyphosate resistance management. And retailer Eric Green in southern Illinois uses Lexar herbicide early to fight hard to control weeds. Although glyphosate resistance is a growing problem, there are solutions. You can develop customized programs for your fields at resistancefighter.com. You can also learn more from your Syngenta crop protection representative and arm yourself to fight resistant weeds.